Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. Today, it's our pleasure to introduce a genuine Renaissance man. Michael Levin is Vannevar Bush Professor in the Department of Biology and Director of the Tufts Center of Regenerative and Developmental Biology. Dr. Levin has received international recognition for his innovative work in how cells communicate as they assemble an embryo or regenerate severed or damaged body parts. Dr. Levin graduated from Tufts University with a double major in computer science and biology in 1992 and just four years later received his PhD in genetics from Harvard University. He went on quickly to prominent research and teaching positions at the Harvard School of Dental Medicine and the Forsyth Institute, which is also affiliated with Harvard and where he eventually headed up the Center for Regenerative and Developmental Biology. He accumulated numerous awards and honors in the process. A few years ago, Tufts University lured him back to Tufts to establish the Center of Regenerative and Developmental Biology there. It's now a thriving center for leading edge research in developmental biology. Dr. Levin's comprehensive expertise spans several fields, biology, engineering, computer science, neuroscience, and medicine. This broad scope is one reason why he's representative of a scientific renaissance. It's part of a trend today toward a convergence of fields. The other reason is his distinctly original approach to science, what we call thinking outside the box. Today, that takes not just super brains, but super nerve to challenge the usual way of doing science. What Dr. Levin and his colleagues are discovering will have an enormous impact on both the scientific understanding of how biological systems work and the potential for medical applications. I'm sure we'll hear much more about the breakthroughs he and his collaborators are achieving in the near future. And it's a very special honor to have the opportunity to talk with him today. Dr. Levin, welcome. Thank you very much for having me here. Yes. Thank you. Um, Let's begin, if you would, uh, with what do you do in embryology? Why is that field such a dynamic one just now? Can you give us a little background? Sure. Um, the process of embryonic development is a remarkable one. If you imagine we all start life as a single cell, the fertilized egg, and yet through this process of self-assembly, each embryo builds a different kind of body. Some become shaped as an elephant or a snake or a tree or an octopus and so on. And so in some fashion, this complex three-dimensional structure is encoded in the information available to the single cell. And uh, many different cell types are created during embryonic development. You have nerves and skin and muscle and things like this and all of them become arranged with the appropriate three-dimensional architecture into whatever kind of tissue is being built. Um, this is quite crucial, and really this ability of uh, living tissues to assemble into complex forms is fundamental to most of medicine. So if you think about uh, uh, birth defects, right, mm -hmm. and, and, and prevention and um, repair of birth defects, as well as regeneration. So, so if you uh, had the ability to, to uh, rebuild a complex structure such as limbs and eyes and so on, then uh, traumatic injury, degenerative disease, mm -hmm. uh, uh, cancer, all of these, uh, even aging, all of these things would be addressed because the fundamental capacity to uh, to build complex structures is is at the core of pretty much every interesting problem in medicine and that if we had f full control over shape we would be able to address all of these issues and you're able to get to this best through embryology so so this 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 first appears during embryonic development but yeah. but it's really crucial during adulthood and uh, regenerative repair as well because uh, during uh, the lifespan of a long living animal so let's say in the human you know 80 to 100 years um, individual cells will age and die mm -hmm. and yet the organism remains and it's able to uh, 
uh, resist uh, um, cancerous uh, conversion and so on because this patterning influence is exerted over the cells of the body that enable uh, healing to take place, enable uh, regeneration of the liver, of the intestinal lining, uh, of the skin, things like this. And so it's not just for embryonic development, but the, idea, the, the ability of uh, cells to communicate and build tissues and structures is important throughout the lifespan. I see. Um, can you tell us <coughs> about the information cells contain? What, what is that? Well, this is, this is a very important set of questions for us because during complex pattern formation, cells have to make a lot of decisions. They have to make decisions on the individual cell level, but they also have to uh, process information that is really uh, embryo-wide. So, for example, in terms of size control, they have to build an embryo of exactly the right size. And so this, uh, the question of when do we stop growing and what direction must we grow, um, these are, uh, this is information that has to be collected among and shared among all of the cells because size, is, the size of the animal is not just a property of, of one cell, it's really a, a feature of the whole organism. Uh, likewise, during regeneration, if a salamander loses its a limb and is going to rebuild uh, another limb, it has to know when to stop. It has to be able to, to, to cease construction of the limb at the appropriate time. So, so really it has to know what shape it is now on the organism level. It has to know what shape it's trying to reach and it has to know how to get from here to there. That is what steps must be undertaken to regenerate that structure. Um, we have many examples of this, for example, in, in embryonic development. Uh, when you move structures around artificially during an experiment, mm -hmm. the animal will often make up for it by, by still putting them in the right place. And so in a sense, it can, the system knows that certain parts have been displaced and it can make the, the corrections needed to put them where they need to go. So the cell is very wise. <laughs> the cell is wise, but also right, right. the tissue and the organ. This yes, is, this is far above the single cell e level exactly, as well. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So can you tell us what regeneration <coughs> is and uh, perhaps explain the difference between that and just ordinary healing? Mm -hmm. like this is uh, somewhat of a, an issue that people uh, argue about and debate, you know, the exact boundary between wound healing and regeneration. But basically, regeneration involves the rebuilding of a, of a complex structure. Mm -hmm. So rebuilding of a limb as opposed to healing over a wound with new skin. So, so wound healing um, is, or, or let's say a muscle repair is when you really need to rebuild one type of tissue. Uh, true regeneration is when you're rebuilding a whole limb, an eye, uh, a complex organ, and I mean some animals will regenerate uh, you know, a whole brain or, or a head and, and so on. That's regeneration. Right. Now, <coughs> some things can, see, can regenerate and some organisms can regenerate at certain stages but yep. not as other. Information for regeneration seems to be somewhat distinct and not all organisms share that capability. Well, th so, so that's one possibility is that in animals that are not able to regenerate that that information is, is, is simply not there. Uh, I suspect that that's not what's going on. Okay. I suspect the information is there. And if we in fact were to uh, be able to uh, uh, force the cells to pay closer attention to that information, we would be able to induce regenerative ability in those stages. Um, regenerative ab ab ability varies widely throughout lifespan and also throughout the tree of life in different species. Um, one thing that is definitely not the case, in which sometimes people have this misconception that regeneration is the province of, of very lowly animals, so worms right, and things like right. this, and that, and that we can't regenerate. That's actually not true. And so um, there are many lower forms that are very similar to uh, animals that do regenerate that themselves don't. And so this, the ability to regenerate is sort of sprinkled um, somewhat uh, um, uh, randomly throughout the tree of life. And right. in fact, uh, some mammals are very good at regenerating. So deer, for example, uh, every year will shed a whole rack of antlers and then uh, in the following year will, will regenerate uh, meters of bone and vasculature and, and velvet and, and so on. And this is an adult mammal regenerating. Human children uh, will regenerate fingertips if, if, uh, if they have a clean amputation below the age of somewhere between seven and 10. And then this process uh, declines as they get older. So you think that there's something like vestigial they're l left in the memory of cells but they're they're not accessing it when you talk about deer adult deer dropping their antlers and, and regrowing antlers deer don't regrow legs or tails they only <coughs> do this yep. but that's an indication the fact that it happens in something suggests to you that it's much more universal. The, the, the latent ability is there. It's much more universal yep. and in adults as well. 
Yeah, and, and this is that the instructions, the genetic instructions that were used to build this structure during embryonic development are still there. They're still present in all of the cells, this okay. is known. And so the question is how, um, how to reactivate that program of growth in the adult. I mean, one reason why deer may not regenerate their legs is that being an adult uh, mammal with a, with a fast metabolism, if, if you lose your leg, the most important thing is to stop blood flow and build a scar as fast as you can, because if you stick around uh, waiting for that leg to regenerate, Generate, you're going to die of blood loss. And so there may be these overlaid sort of emergency right. responses that are preventing regeneration because uh, evolutionarily it's just much, much more important to, um, to, to stop the bleeding and just seal off that wound and never mind what happens after that. Whereas in human patients, of course, we can, we can manage this in other ways. And, and, and I do think fundamentally that the information to build these structures still exists. It can be reactivated if we provide the appropriate environment for the wound. Um, and, and the antlers that are restored year after year are, have the same pattern. And so it's mm -hmm. clear that, mm -hmm. that there is this capacity to rebuild a complex multi-tissue branch structure, even in, in mammals. And so I'm, I'm quite optimistic that this will work someday. You have stressed the bioelectric uh, feature for getting at this, uh, the knowledge that the cells have for doing this, and you're quite famous for a very unique experiment of having an eye grow in the gut of a tadpole only by manipulating this bioelectric feature. Could you explain that? And then I would like to distinguish that from, say, uh, some other ways of, of doing regeneration. Okay, so you did this wonderful experiment. Could you explain that to us? Certainly. Uh, so, so cells communicate using many types of signals. During, uh, during building a complex structure, the cells have to coordinate their behavior. So they have to coordinate their growth rates, the direction in which they grow, what kind of tissues they're going to make, and so on. And some of that communication is chemical. So they send uh, specific chemicals mm -hmm. back and forth to each other to signal that you be a bone cell, I'm going to be a muscle cell, and things like this. Uh, but there's really a very important uh, other layer to this communication, which takes place electrically. So electrical properties of cells, that is voltage gradients or, or voltage mm -hmm. potentials across the cell membrane, are an important uh, director of cell behavior. They, cells use these gradients to determine where they are located. They use these gradients to uh, align their their activities relative to the rest of the body. So um, th there's, there's a lot of information uh, stored in these electrical uh, properties of cells and the exchange of electrical signals among cells. And this is what my laboratory focuses on. And can you uh, describe the experiment with the, I think it was the tadpole, uh, <coughs> how that worked? Because the distinguishing feature, I think, was simply by manipulating this almost like an external thing, the voltage. Uh, can you explain that, uh, describe that wonderful experiment? Sure. One of the things we are interested in is in cracking the bioelectric code. So there's a genetic code that where people are well aware that that maps um, genetic sequences onto specific tissue structures. So it's known that certain types of gene networks will build, a, you know, a leg or a back or an eye or a brain or something like that. Uh, we are interested in understanding the bioelectric code. That is, understanding how certain electrical properties of cells determine what structures you're you're going mm -hmm. to you're going to have. This is really important because for regenerative medicine or for the repair of birth defects, you want to be able to exert control over shape. And you want to be able to say, I want an eye here, or I want two extra fingers here, or I want to correct this, uh, the, 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 the shape of the face over here. And so as part of, that, uh, part of that effort, we developed techniques to very subtly change the electrical properties of key cells in living systems. Mm -hmm. And so we don't use electric fields. This is not a case mm -hmm. of electric field application. What we do is manipulate the proteins that are inside of cells that regulate ion flow, that is the flow of charged molecules like potassium, sodium, chloride, and so on, in and out of the cell. So we were able to use uh, any number of specific strategies that modulate either potassium levels or sodium levels or chloride to change uh, the, the membrane potential of cells inside the tadpole. And what we observed is that within a narrow range, if we set the voltage range of cells to this particular uh, value, these cells would initiate the formation of an eye. So they would, uh, they would make, in some cases, uh, just certain eye tissues. In other mm -hmm. cases, they would make the whole entire eye. And we can do this in any, uh, pretty much any tissue of the, of the tadpole, thus the, the eye on the gut. This is actually uh, also important for another reason, which is that the traditional understanding of how 
cells become specified to be eye or liver or kidney or whatever um, has to do with lineage restriction. So during early embryonic development, you have cells that could be anything. They're basically mm -hmm, stem mm -hmm, cells. Mm -hmm. And then with time, they become more and more specialized. And the current textbook understanding of which tissues can become eye suggests that uh, only cells in the, uh, in the anterior neural yes. part, of the eye, part of the head are able to become eye. The other cells of the body are thought not to have the competence to become eye. Um, as it, and, and this is true when, when using uh, known genetic modulators of, of differentiation. So uh, things like uh, master uh, eye regulator mm -hmm, genes mm -hmm. can induce extra eyes, but they only do this in the head right. itself. Okay. We were able to show that by tweaking the membrane voltage, we could actually get this to happen in any cells of the body, which suggests that the restriction uh, among different cell types is, is, is not as, as hard and fast as previously thought. And also it suggests that these sorts of bioelectrical methods are a really powerful way to change mm -hmm. the identity of cells. This is another important tool in our toolbox that we're going to be using to direct shape during regenerative medicine applications. Right. What about in the adult level? Obviously the issue in medicine uh, would be for things like amputees, sure. and I think you are already anticipating this, sure. that if there's this latent competence of cells, you could do all kinds of things. Yes, sure. Do you think that capacity is there, and how would you do that? Can you do you have ideas about sure. that? Yes, um, we, are, uh, we are already working on this, of course, mm -hmm. and the idea is that in order to initiate, uh, let's say limb, let's focus on limb repair in, yeah. in, in humans, uh, you need to do two things. You need to first provide uh, the correct signal that will initiate the whole program of building a limb. This is very important. One of the things that we've learned from our bioelectrical work is that these signals are able to provide what we call master regulator yeah. types of signals. That is, when we induce a tadpole to rebuild its tail or to build an eye, it isn't because we've learned to, to sort of bioengineer these organs from scratch. In mm -hmm. fact, that's something that's going to be beyond us for many, many years. This is, uh, these organs are very complex. And even if, if stem cell biology were to the point where you could make any tissue you wanted out of stem cells, you would still have to somehow assemble them into a limb or an eye. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is well beyond capability. What instead we've learned to do is to provide um, very simple signals that initiate coordinated downstream responses in the host organism. So we don't know how to build an eye from scratch, but what we do know is how to tell the host organism, this is the place where you need an eye, go. And the organism still contains all of the information needed to do that, and so that's really important because that suggests that we will have the ability to, to rebuild some of these organs long before we know everything there is about being able to sort of micromanage them mm -hmm, ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so you need two things to do this in, in medical application. You need to know the right signal that will say build a limb here, and you need the technology to deliver that signal and to provide a comprehensive environment that will allow the wound and the remaining host tissue to do its job. So one of the things we're working on with collaborators um, in, uh, for example, David Kaplan and the uh, biomedical engineering department here at Tufts, we're making something we call biodomes, which are these regenerative sleeves that fit onto a wound, um, onto a limb amputation, and they provide an, an amniotic-like environment, an mm -hmm. aqueous-like environment mm -hmm. where all of these electrical and chemical and other signals can take place. And so it supports, you know, wound healing in dry air is a very, uh, that's a lot to ask. What you really need is a very embryonic-like environment where it's aqueous, you know, most animals, with the exception of deer, most animals that regenerate well are aquatic animals. And the reason uh, is because in water, all of these uh, voltage gradients are much easier to control in water. And uh, this is what we're trying to provide. So, that, so our two-pronged approach is figure out what the right signal is going to be, and then develop the technology to provide that signal over the course of limb regeneration so that to support the building of the limb, um, reduce scar tissue inflammation, all of those things. Right. When, can I take you back to the eye for a sure. minute? The eye, of course, <clears throat> is phenomenally complex. Is the signal, like for eye, in the tadpole the same as eye in anything else? Once you get eye, is that it? If you yeah. could do the eye, could you do it universally? Yeah. That's, uh, that's an excellent question, and we're in the process of uh, determining whether or not that's true. We, we see two types of effects. On the one hand, we see a type of bioelectric code that really maps specific voltage properties to tissue outcomes. So we can make eyes, we can make limbs, we can make, um, uh, we can make uh, changes in craniofacial structures, we can make hearts, 
Uh, we can cause uh, tails to repair. So tail, that's important because tails have spinal cord and, and muscle and so on. Um, so, so on the one hand, we have some control over what the different structures are. And that means that these structures have a sort of code associated with them. And then that's an excellent question. Uh, will that code be the same in every organism at every stage of life? And we need to do that research to find out. The other, the other side of the coin, though, is that in many cases, what we seem to have is a signal that basically says, regenerate what is appropriate at this site. Mm. So our first discovery of being able to induce uh, complete regeneration of the tail, okay? So we have a, you have a, a tadpole, you've amputated the tail, and then you can, you can treat that wound, uh, um, uh, change the electrical properties of the wound cells, and it will in, re regenerate a whole tail. So what we found is that it, it, it really matters very little at that point what the specific uh, a voltage gradient that we provide is. It really uh, just means regenerate the structure here, and we don't have to tell it what, what goes. It, it basically just builds what's appropriate. It doesn't build a tiny tail or a giant tail or right. a tumor or anything else. It builds a normal tail of exactly the right size, and then it stops. And so this is what really gives me hope that, um, that in application to, to, uh, to patients, we're going to have that master regulator signal where we're not going to have to provide all of the detailed information about how big is it and where there's you know, a muscle here and then a couple of nerves here and then another muscle. We're not exactly. going to have to do that. An architecture. We're not going to have to uh, micromanage it at that right. level. We're right. going to be able to provide a, a signal that basically reboots the tissue, as it were, and says, no, your, your shape is not correct. Re, uh, reinitiate pattern formation of what you need at that spot. And that's, and that's what we're looking for. You're trying to get as smart as the cells. <laughs> yeah. that, like, um, that Do people, do you know a lot about this information that they have, that the cells have? We know some things, and, and really, uh, we're at very early, the field itself is a very early baby steps in this process, okay? We're just beginning to understand uh, what it is that cells know. Part of the issue is that nowadays, um, most of the models that are being made in developmental biology are models of, of genetics. So we talk about yeah. gene function, gene regulatory networks, and so on. Um, but we really need to understand more about three-dimensional pattern formation, and we really need to make more uh, models that are that are based in information processing that really talk about um, what it is that cells are computing, counting, um, uh, exchanging, and and what it is that that is stored in these chemical and physiological networks that allows pattern formation to take place. So we have we have many examples where we're trying to figure that out. For example, um, in one case in the a metamorphosis that takes a tadpole to a frog. So tadpole faces and frog faces are in fact quite different. And so mm -hmm. there are, there's a whole series of rearrangements that happen um, when you go from a tadpole to a frog. And previously it was thought that what's encoded in the genetics is, is, is sort of a hardwired set of movements. The eyes move a little bit here, the jaws move a little bit here, and so on. It turns out that that's not the case. And so w what happens is if you uh, make specific defects in the tadpole, that is you move things out of place, in, in many cases, the final frog still looks exactly correct mm -hmm. because what the tadpole did in that metamorphosis is not simply uh, move everything the way it was hardwired to, but actually it, it, it was able to detect where things were and make appropriate corrections. So this is a very uh, sort of intelligent, adaptive response where the tissues are able to communicate to say, okay, we, uh, we are not in the right place and you need to move further than you otherwise would have in order to end up in the right place. We have other examples where, for example, in uh, planaria, in these flatworms, when you, when you uh, chop uh, them, let's say, into thirds, and you have this middle fragment where you've chopped off the head or the tail, the, uh, each wound uh, knows what it's going to make. The polarity is, is preserved, and the two wounds have to communicate with each other so that only one of them makes the head, the other one will make the tail, so that you always have the right kind of worm. The same during scaling. So. Uh, a planarian, if it is starved over the period of about a month, the whole worm will shrink. And as it shrinks, it remodels its whole body so that all of the tissues are in the same proportion that, are, that is described by a mathematical uh, relationship that keeps them constant. So the ratio of all the tissues and, and the, the measurements of all the cell, um, uh, cellular structures to each other remains constant. And so this is ex an exquisite mm -hmm. em, uh, example of, of orchestration because as the cell number shrinks because the food supply is low, uh, the whole, the, basically the whole animal has to be re-specified to stay a, a miniature copy of the original worm. And so the, these are the sorts of models that we use to try to understand what in information is being exchanged during these remarkable processes. I think you got started with uh, complex adaptive systems in, your, uh, in, in a period when you were doing computer science. And that's to ask if, 
if this is very much like this? Do you see the, this sort of fulfilling the ideas of, of complex adaptive systems, the principles there? Well, in, in the field of, of computer engineering and complex adaptive systems, what we would love to be able to do is to build artificial structures that are able to repair themselves, to sense damage, to change their, their, their three-dimensional uh, orientation as appropriate. Um, we, we basically don't have any of those things, you know, and, and we look to the biological world for examples of control and regulatory mechanisms that will allow us to do that. You know, we send a, 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 um, a rover up to Mars and if, a, you know, if something happens to it, that's pretty much mm -hmm, it. You know, mm -hmm. these, these things are not uh, self-repairing and, and this whole uh, process of trying to build what they call robust robotic technologies that will actually uh, sense damage and self-repair uh, is, a, is a huge um, huge challenge for, for, uh, for engineering. Uh, living things do this sort of naturally, yeah. right? Oh, just about any living creature can do this. And so we study the living world in order to understand these basic fundamental principles so that we can um, uh, we can embody them in artificial devices. This is, of course, a type of synthetic biology where uh, we take the principles of what we've learned from real living systems and we implement them in completely different media, mm -hmm. but the, the, the control structures are the same. Right. Um, can you explain a little bit some of the big projects you're going through in your lab, what you're planning to do in your lab? And I'm assuming that one is this, the bioelectric sleeve. Um, First of all, how soon do you think you'll be able to come up with something like that? Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm certainly not going to try to guess at a, at a, at a, at a year uh, right. length <laughs> limit. Uh, right. People ask this all the time, and, and, and for good reason. Um, I, I don't know. I don't yeah. know the answer to that. Um, I, think, I think we are making good progress. We, right. we have the sleeves. We're in, uh, we're in experiments now in animal models. and. Um, I'm, I'm quite optimistic, but I, I'm not going to put a year, a year right. on this. But the various things we're doing in our lab all sort of converge onto some of these same issues. Mm -hmm. And so, so we have uh, projects looking at this bioelectric code in a number of systems, so in flatworm regeneration, in craniofacial repair, where it looks like some of these electrical gradients are actually subtle pre-patterns for gene expression in the same way that gene expression is a pre-pattern for anatomy. Mm -hmm. uh, so trying to understand how we can use these, uh, these electrical signals to guide tissue pattern. And um, the same with, with regeneration of, of, of uh, limbs in the frog and so on. So these are, these are all efforts designed to really understand the information embedded in physiological networks. And you know, the extension of this also, in, again, going back to the, some of the synthetic biology links, trying to create computational tissues, that is, mm -hmm. non-neural tissues like uh, bone networks or muscle networks or, or other types of mesenchymal cells and so on, that are actually communicating with each other via these electrical cues to perform computations that are useful for us, not only to, to in pattern formation, but in other, in other ways. We also have uh, projects in, in sort of at the border of, of developmental biology and neuroscience. One of the interesting things about these uh, tadpoles with ectopic eyes is that these ectopic eyes can see. And so we do behavioral uh, analysis and some, and some neuroscience work on these, on these animals because we would like to understand how plastic is the brain. You know, presumably the frog brain was evolved to deal with exactly two eyes, and so how many eyes can it actually <laughs> deal with, right? And, and this has applications in, in the future for human sensory augmentation, for vision for the blind, um, or maybe even vision in weird modalities for the non-blind. Let's say somebody wanted to see an infrared in addition to their normal, uh, their normal vision. How, how many of these sensors could the brain actually use? And the other remarkable thing about these, uh, these kinds of um, experiments is that uh, you know, if there's, a, if there's a set of tissues, uh, if you have this eye somewhere on the tail of the embryo, of the, of the tadpole rather, and it is providing visual data to the brain, and the brain is, is treating that as, as, as visual data, how does the brain know that the signal coming down the spinal cord from somewhere in the tail is actually visual data? You know, mm -hmm. there's really no evolutionary precedent for right. it to expect any such thing, and how does it know? Right. And so these are issues we're very interested in, the relationship between the brain and the body morphology, what right. organs exist, you know, uh, how does it know that this information coming down the spinal cord is actually visual information, and, and how does it know what organs the brain, the nervous system is innervating? The same is true for some of these animals that have ectopic uh, legs, you know, extra right. limbs and right. things like this. Right. So, so that's very interesting. Um, the flatworms in particular are part of that because these animals, uh, they regenerate any part of their body, including the brain and central nervous system, but they're also fairly smart. You can train them to run mazes and things like this. And so for the first time in the same animal, you can study 
the dynamics of, of, of memory during brain regeneration. What happens to memories when the brain is massively regenerated? This has medical implications too because you know, we're talking about putting uh, stem cells into, into adult brains for treatment of, let's say, degenerative uh, brain disease. And so if you've got a 50-year-old patient who has, you know, decades of, of memories and experience, and now his, his, his brain is being filled with descendants of naive stem cells, um, w what happens to these memories and what happens to the cognition of the, of the patient and so on? And so these are the sorts of things that we're studying at the, at the intersection between body shape and nervous system structure. Do you see this line of research kind of replacing stem cell research or is it together? What do you think for the future? Well, I certainly uh, don't think it's going to replace stem cell research. I think um, it, it addresses, the, the, these issues are, are, are separate. Mm -hmm. so, so stem cell biology seeks to figure out how it is that we take a naive cell and transform it into some particular needed tissue type. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a question at the level of a single tissue type. And, mm -hmm. and there are many diseases that require one specific tissue type, right. diabetes and things like right. this. Um, and, so, and so for that, that's the technology to use. On the other hand, for more complex regenerative approaches, um, being able to differentiate your stem cells into various tissues by itself does not give you a limb or an eye or anything like that. And so, so you will still need to understand the three-dimensional pattern formation aspects to fully make use of stem cell technology. Now also, many, um, many animals that regenerate do so without the benefit of stem cells. Mm -hmm. They regenerate either with somatic cells, um, or in the, with tissue renewal and, and, and other, other ways where uh, it's clear that some, uh, some amount of regeneration can take place uh, not involving stem cells at all. And so I think together, these are, I think these are technologies that go hand in hand. And certain things will be better addressed through bioengineering of stem cells, and other things are going to only be addressed by providing appropriate signals to the host patient, um, uh, to the host organism to enable complex pattern formation. I see. And do you th think this is going to change the field of biology generally that you have this other kind of area now that people may need to be looking much more expansively so when we're training students and as undergraduates or whatever and medicine will this change things yeah the I, I, bioelectric I, I, factor I, mean. I, I think the bioelectric uh, uh, work will be will be important um, this is this is a very important part of our toolbox well, it's a sure. powerful part of the toolbox right. and so certainly I think I think it will be more more widely uh, more widely taken into into account but I think the other thing that really is going to uh, change things um, is a, a an approach to pattern formation that is is from the perspective of the information sciences you know one mm -hmm. of the one of the issues that we have with current uh, models is that most current models exist at the level of gene regulatory networks right. and, and and we're spending uh, a lot of um, a lot of effort in in nailing down exactly which genes turn on which other which other on and off other genes but of course those kinds of networks by themselves do not specify three-dimensional structure and so it's really important to start to, to develop tools uh, to understand uh, where that structure comes from and how we're going to manipulate it. In particular, we, you know, we have bioinformatics, but bioinformatics at this moment deals mostly with uh, gene sequences and gene networks and you know, genomics mm -hmm, and things like mm -hmm. this. We have no bioinformatics of shape. And so this is mm -hmm. one of the things we're actually doing in our lab is, is developing computational approaches to uh, understand pattern formation and to really start to develop the same kind of tools that have become available for gene sequences, but now for actual three-dimensional structures so that we can start to get a handle on the control of pattern formation. And this in general, these kinds of uh, building these kinds of um, constructivist models where every step in the model actually tells the cell what it needs to do as opposed to a gene regulatory network which by itself does not specify topology. And so, so starting to build these kind of constructive models that uh, actually tell you how the shape is, is, is generated is going to be crucial because those are the kinds of models that let you figure out what you need to tweak to change the shape. It really is, is at this moment, uh, very difficult to know how to change the shape just mm -hmm. by uh, having the gen gene regulatory network in hand. Uh, we need models where, where it's going to be much more obvious that, well, I need, you know, I'd like a bigger eye or I'd like a, you know, an extra finger or something like this. You need to know where and what kind of signal you're going to be providing to do that. And, and, and that is, you know, real computer science and, and other aspects of the information sciences have to become a, a bigger part of developmental biology. I think the applications will be extremely wide. Um, people have thought about these issues, uh, be, you know, before. And so, 
uh, I think, I think um, new advances in this direction with new technologies mm -hmm. that we have and, and new ways of thinking about the data that, that we do have are, are really going to open up some very exciting areas in biology. And this, you know, this goes well beyond development as well. If you think right. about, uh, for example, the problem of cancer, where you have uh, you know, cells in the body that have ceased to, to uh, in, many, in many ways, they, they've ceased to obey the normal patterning cues of the host, and they've gone off on their own, and they're building a tumor structure instead of whatever they're supposed to be building. Uh, you know, years ago, they, they did a remarkable experiment where uh, tumors were, were induced on the limb of a newt, and then the limb was amputated through the middle of the tumor, leaving half of the tumor behind. As that limb regenerated, the remaining tumor cells became normalized and reworked into the normal uh, cells of a, of a limb that resulted. And so the, the, the strong patterning influence that must be exerted during, re during regeneration can tame cancer. And so we've seen this now in many different types of works uh, where a, a normal environment, whether it be a regenerative or an embryonic environment, can normalize tumor cells. And this, this is all extremely important um, alongside all of the work on, on genetic mutations as a source of, of cancer and DNA instability and things like this, there really is a very important aspect of the environment, the cellular environment, which is important for a cell to be normal versus neoplastic. And these are all issues that are going to be uh, better addressed by an informational type of approach mm -hmm. where, where we really start to ask, okay, what signals do cells need to get to enable them to participate in the normal program of the host versus to go off on their own into a, into a tumor-like structure. Um, can you explain to us, a, to refresh our memories, with cancer you have a bizarre kind of cellular situation? So, so, so certainly cancer cells are bizarre in many ways and in some cases irreversibly so. That mm -hmm. is if the genome is, is damaged to the point where um, regulatory control points simply cannot be activated and so on, then, then they, may stay, uh, uh, they may stay damaged and abnormal forever. But in many cases it's actually remarkable what can be done to normalize cells even with considerable amounts of genetic mutation. And so um, cells that, that are, that are uh, the cells from, uh, from very aggressive tumors can be placed in an embryonic environment, and this was done 30, 40 years ago, let's say in a, in a mouse embryo, and they are completely normalized. They, they participate in, in building the mouse embryo, and they're quite normal, and the mice are quite normal, and that's the end of it. And so, so having an environment that provides patterning cues mm -hmm. that overrides the cell's uh, innate tendency to um, to, to build these tumor-like structures and, and sort of recruits them to the uh, patterning needs of the host is a very powerful approach. And this is something that I think is, is going to be studied more and more mm -hmm. because the current strategies for cancer are all focused on killing the, the yes. cancer cells, and that's a fine thing, except that in many cases what happens is you activate a compensatory re, um, proliferation response. When, when lots of uh, cancer cells die, they release trophic factors, chemicals that get the other cells near, near them, the other tumor cells, to start dividing like crazy to take up the slack. And so, so rather than killing them, normalizing them is, is powerful. And, and more than even just a clinical type of approach, it's really, I think, of, of huge importance fundamentally to understand what is the information that distinguishes a tumor from normal tissue? Yeah. Where is that patterning lost and, and regained? And uh, you know, what are the mechanisms by which this information is passed back and forth? I think that, that's gonna be quite crucial. Right, do you know a lot about this, this, this funny difference that overcomes the cells. <laughs> we do not. Um, okay. Most of the efforts along these lines have gone into genetic and genomic analyses right. of, of right. cancer cells and, and certainly uh, you know lots of uh, useful drugs have been developed and, and so on but uh, I think it's safe to say that that we're more um, ignorant about, we're ignorant about more things th than we actually know I think in this yeah. area. Well it's interesting simply because for years now there's been so much devotion to cancer research yeah. and this seems like when you think about it from the outside, a very obvious way to look at the problem. It's a very different yeah. way, but a very natural or obvious uh, kind of insight. And I had never heard of it before. Yeah. So uh, I wonder how long it will take to kind of redirect to look at this. Yeah. Well, I think uh, one of the reasons why many people have not heard of it is that 
doing this kind of research is 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 difficult. That is, you know, it's we we have all sorts of we, all sorts of technologies for characterizing genetic differences between cells, right. and so so that's what we've been using, and and right. we have we've been doing it in models like mouse, which is not highly regenerative, and 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 these these tools, um, you know, why has it taken this long for bioelectricity right. to really take off? Exactly. Because with the rise of molecular biology. Uh, many t hot, very very powerful tools were developed that are really perfect for dealing with biochemical signals but the tools for dealing with biophysical signals or large-scale patterning signals are only now really starting to be mm. developed and so I think I think that's the that's the you know that that's what's what's going to be necessary for to, to really um, uh, propel this uh, to really propel this forward right. I mean if w one of the one of the things you can see right away is the, this question of why are some organisms more regenerative than others yes. and so so people ask okay so so why are human uh, beings for example um, not as regenerative as some other creatures and the, the sort of textbook answer that's given is that if you're going to have a long-lived animal you know you want to uh, live for 80 100 years and you want to resist cancer during that whole time then the way to do that is to have an organism where the cells do re really do not slip back into a, into a proliferative mode very quickly. Mm. That is, you have to have an animal where there are not a lot of um, immature, undifferentiated cells. You don't have a lot of new cell growth because if you have those things around as an adult, you're likely to have tumors. Um, that model f focuses on cellular level growth decisions, you know, grow, don't grow, mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm. on. And that model makes also a prediction. It makes the prediction that animals that are highly regenerative are going to show a lot of cancer, and animals that are non-regenerative are going to show much reduced um, levels of cancer. So that, uh, that prediction, as it turns out, is completely wrong. Um, if you look throughout the tree of life, animals that are good regenerators tend to have very, very low incidences of cancer, and vice versa. And so where that does make sense is not at the level of individual cell growth decisions, but at the level of uh, large-scale patterning signals. Because if you're an animal that can exert very strong patterning influence, you're going to be able to do two things. You're going to be able to repattern new growth uh, at the wound site, which will enable you to regenerate, but you're also going to be able to exert that influence over body cells during adulthood to suppress mm. uh, cancerous uh, conversion because you're going to keep cells um, to the normal uh, patterning needs of, of the body. In contrast, animals that do not have this ability for whatever reason are going to be poor regenerators and also prone to, to tumors. Mm -hmm. And so, so there's, I think, a, a specific example where this higher level view of, of, of patterning um, information gives a better prediction of what you actually see in nature than, a, than a, a perspective that's focused on individual cells. Now the trick there, of course, is to uh, go in and, and understand the, the, the physical and the chemical um, properties of these signals and what do we really mean when we say that you know the host has exerted control over this regenerative region and, and normalized tumor cells. What does that really mean in terms of signaling? So that's the challenge now. That's what we need to do. Right. You mentioned that this is a difficult area of research, and in a sense, people are schooled to do it the genetic uh, approach anyway. But now, if there's going to be a shift, can you, then people have to kind of train in a different way, evidently. And can you give us a sense of that? And your lab would be an example of it. Evidently, you took a whole boatload of people with you when you went back to uh, Tufts to set up the lab there. Uh, can you give us an idea of the skill set uh, mm -hmm. and the kinds of approaches that you use? Yeah, um, you know, I've spent uh, uh, 10 years now assembling a very specific group of people and, and, and we moved them all when we came to Tufts, you know, 18 or 19 people. Um, the various skill sets include basic cell and molecular biology, mm -hmm. uh, biochemistry, but also computer science, um, also mathematical uh, biology, um, bioengineering, these are all, you know, these are all represented in our group and I think, you know, important problems in biology don't sort themselves neatly into genetic problems, chemistry yeah. problems and so on. They require many different, what we call different disciplines, you know, the, to, to, to biology. These are all simply things that are, that are used and it's up to us to figure out um, how we're going to understand them. And I think, I think uh, approaches from mathematics, from computer science and physics are increasingly recognized as crucial for mm -hmm. understanding these things. Right, and very comprehensive skills, of, yep. uh, evidently, and people that are w able to learn uh, at a fairly deep level a whole lot of areas. 
uh, yes, to and, contribute. And the trick is then, f then, then, c then folding the information back together because right. part of the issue yeah. is that a lot of these different um, experts in these disciplines, they really speak different languages. Yes. They see problems in very different ways. They consider, you know, what do you consider to be a proper answer to a particular question varies widely depending on who you ask. And some things are of complete irrelevance to a physicist that would be, you know, uh, really what the biologist wants to know and vice yes. versa. And uh, to some extent that's good because you get different perspectives. But in the end, if you're going to do this multidisciplinary work, um, all of these kinds of uh, different types of information have to be folded together and the communication among them has to be, uh, has to be better than it is now. And that's a challenge. That's something that we work right. on. Right. That's kind of ironic. It sounds like cells have very good communication, <laughs> but humans caught in the uh, project of understanding cells have great difficulty communicating across their yeah. specific specialties, I well, guess. Well, cells have had, uh, you know, billions of <laughs> years of true. evolution They've to figure this out, right? Well. Maybe uh, we should keep plugging you, away. You know, <laughs> physics is maybe uh, 300 years old or whatever, right. and, and this sort of biology is, is really very young. Yes. Um, we're Molecular we're, biology sure, is we're, a young field. Yeah, and we're, we're really just, we, we, you know, it's really just the beginning. Exactly. I, I wish you every success. It's very exciting to read about your lab. Thank you very much. And uh, I appreciate very much your being with us here today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. to know how you came to get into this field uh, in the first place. Well, my, my original training was in computer science, and I worked in artificial intelligence and complex adaptive systems interested in uh, making uh, artificial um, uh, structures and artificial uh, robotics and so on that would have these interesting capabilities of, of adaptive uh, self-repair and, and, and behavior and so on. Uh, and, and it became pretty clear early on that we would have to really pay a lot of attention to how this happens in the living world. And the most impressive ex uh, example of this kind of thing that I could think of was what happens in, during embryogenesis. Mm. That a single cell could reliably self-assemble into such an incredibly co complex uh, pattern suggests that that's really what we need to study to understand how we could make this work. <clears throat> so you got interested in how things make shapes. How, yeah, uh, exactly. How structure is specified, how it's repaired, how it's sensed, how a, 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 a living organism is able to detect deviations in pattern and structure, how it's able to know what it needs to do to, to make those changes. And so uh, I went to graduate school for molecular genetics and to study developmental biology and so on. Having control over shape, it would be incredibly profound. It would yeah. really address, uh, certainly uh, it, it's easy to see how it, it would take care of uh, things like birth defects and um, traumatic injury right. and, and so on. But as we, as we mentioned, it also addresses cancer. Yeah. It also addresses aging. You know, we have animals that in model systems in our lab that are, as far as we know, completely immortal. Mm -hmm. The individual cells age and die, but the organism itself regenerates any, uh, any piece. And so the animal is basically without limit of lifespan. And so this is, uh, being able to control shape is a solution to aging. It's a solution to de degenerative disease, because if you can rebuild any damaged tissue that that takes care of that um, and of course it's also uh, the key to all sorts of uh, you know sci-fi like applications right. where where um, there might be body or sensory modifications that might be needed uh, or wanted you know but uh, in the future and so and so really the control of shape I think is 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 a if not the fundamental question of, of biology I think it, it 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 sheds lights on light on pretty much everything else right the other thing is that we'll be evolving in a bionic way, clearly, it's, it's very clear direction yeah. there, and certainly as we colonize space or do all of these things, and so all of these ideas that you are generating are very much necessary for the future, aren't they? That certainly. we'll be able to regenerate, that we'll be able certainly. to... Certainly, and we have, and we have, um, we have funding partners that are not only biomedical uh, foundations, but also the space agencies. Yeah, and, uh, you, you I know, bet. Th these, yeah, these are, these are issues right. that are going to be absolutely crucial. Very special crucial. adaptations yeah. and, exactly. and so on. What's your favorite part of your work? Um, the, the best part of all this, well, there are many good, I mean, this is the best job in the world, and so there are, there are many good aspects about this. Uh, really, um, having the availability of, of the tools and the, and the uh, brilliant colleagues and the, 
um, everything we need to, to make fundamental discoveries, to really find out things that have never been known before, that are of fundamental importance, is, uh, it's about the greatest thing ever. It's hard to, hard to describe and, and really um, I, I feel incredibly fortunate to have the opportunity every day to go into a place that is just uh, packed with all of the tools necessary to let myself and my, and my colleagues uh, probe uh, these, these fascinating aspects of biology and discover things that have never been known before. That, that's just I'm, great. It must be amazing. Um, it is amazing. Um, certainly the other thing that, that uh, I look forward to is some sort of a biomedical application for some yeah. of our work. I think the potential is enormous and I would really love to see some of this impact real people, uh, real, you know, make a real impact on, on society and on, on health and so on. And that's something that I look forward to in the future. Yeah, I'm sure you'll see it. I uh, hope. In, I hope. In your time. I hope. Right. Many of these things take decades, yeah, but you're certainly, it sounds like it, it's a question of time now. It is a question to, of time. Uh, yeah. to, to actually have it implemented yeah. in some way. Any frustrations with this kind of work? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult work and uh, there are many things that uh, don't work. Um, when you try them and sometimes you will never know mm -hmm. why they didn't work because you don't have the time to sort of repeat it 50 million times right. and figure out why you have to go on and try different things. So, um, you know, f the other, of course, uh, difficulty that we all face is, is, is funding levels. Yes. You know, funding levels are, are quite, uh, quite low at this point. And one of the things that happens when, when research money is tight is that uh, y the selection uh, process becomes very risk averse, and that means that um, they are they are very um, uh, reluctant to uh, to to attempt anything where it's really not clear what the outcome is going to be ahead of time, and so and so this is very difficult because it it, it of course holds back progress. It becomes right. um, very hard to do uh, real cutting edge edge stuff, and and certainly there are lots of people doing that kind of work, but. Um, the, 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 the low pay lines in, at, at most institutions and most foundations and various sources of funding uh, are making it really challenging. You know, we spend a tremendous amount of our time uh, writing and rewriting various grant proposals, tweaking this and tweaking that uh, in order to try and, get, uh, try and get money, and that takes away time from the actual research. Exactly. Um, not that I have a better system in mind for how to do this, of <laughs> course, or where the money would come from, but that's one of the frustrations. Well, they say that if Darwin were writing an application, a grant application now, he'd never get through National Science Foundation well, and uh, there'd be a it's, few others. It's possible. Because it's <laughs> out of the box. You it's, know, it's, it's, too, it's too risky, uh, this, this kind of thing. He couldn't prove it yeah. all right away and so on. But it's an important thing for the public to understand yeah. that these, this is a very great frustration yeah. sometimes. This, this, is, this is really important. You know, these, uh, the funding for basic science uh, is is the foundation for all of the um, the wonders of medicine and technology that yes. people see today, and these things don't uh, don't just appear, uh, you know, from nowhere. And, and it's really the very basic work of scientists working on deep, deep and important problems. And, and these problems are, are expensive to deal with. You know, all yes. of the easy stuff has been done years ago. You know, we're simply to the point now where. Uh, asking fundamental questions requires some big bucks. It requires lots of smart people working together. It requires expensive Over equipment time. and yeah. it requires time. And, and that's where the transformative uh, technologies that are going to really change and improve society, um, they require basic research and, yes. and funding. And having said that, <coughs> any advice for young people going into these fields? I think the biggest thing I can, I can uh, suggest to people going into uh, biology and, and especially developmental biology is to uh, uh, study more computer science, real computer science, mm -hmm. not just bioinformatics, because that really, um, as, as useful as it is, it, it uses a very uh, sort of thin, uh, very narrow um, set of techniques from computer science, but to really study the information sciences and engineering uh, and, and really understand computation for um, uh, applying a, a sort of novel paradigms to developmental biology. I think that's where most of the future is going to be, and that's where that, that would be one suggestion. So they have to get a pretty comprehensive background. People need a much more comprehensive background than, say, a decade or two, that would be my, 20 uh, years ago. That would ago. be my, my guess, okay. yeah. Dr. Levin, thank you very thank much you very for joining much. us. Thank it you for having me It was a here. great pleasure talking thank with you. you.